Today on Larry King Now, the talented Patricia Arquette on her Oscar nomination for Boyhood. It's a little bit terrifying, I guess, yeah. I mean, I never even imagined that I'd be nominated for an Oscar and that in itself, no one could take that away, so that's pretty incredible. On Hollywood Today. I have worked in a business that has thought audiences don't want to see that. But the truth is, in my part, a struggling single mom, we know this woman in our life, but filmmakers don't really examine her. Plus, a famous role you turned down. Uh, in Pulp Fiction. You turned down Pulp Fiction. It's all next on Larry King Now. Over the last three decades, Patricia Arquette has had one of the most eclectic and impressive careers in Hollywood. Many of the industry's most celebrated directors, including Tim Burton, David Lynch, and Martin Scorsese, have tapped into her incomparable talent, which makes it no surprise that directed Richard Lanklater called upon her to take on the role of Olivia in the groundbreaking film Boyhood, a role that would span more than a decade and has garnered her a Golden Globe Award and an Academy Award nomination. This must be a swirl for you, right? What is it like, what you're going through? Well, it's kind of mind-boggling because really I never expected it at all. And none of us expected this from this little movie that we made. Little movie. <laughs> it was like a project because usually you go to make a movie and a year later it comes out and the, and... There's a lot more producers on the set. There's a lot more influence from the studio. But with this, the first year we went and shot, and then it didn't come out. The second year we went and shot, and it didn't come out. By the third year, it really just felt, and it was more about the process than anything When they else. sat down and showed it to you, discussed the script and the like, did you think, well, I'm ready to give years of my life to this? Yeah, what happened was Richard called me and he said, um, I'm thinking about doing this movie where we shoot a week a year for 12 years. And everything in my body was like, yes, I want to do this. Yes? Yes, because I knew from film that that had never been done in film. We have a long history of film. It's very rare to, to be able to do anything that hasn't been done yet. And I also thought, how the hell did you get the financing? Because it's so hard to get movies financed, especially small movies now. Second of all, you can't contractually obligate anyone in America for longer than seven years. So the kid, our lead, could have left in the middle of it. And where would we be at that point? These are characters we see in our real lives, but we really don't see in movies. A single mom, the choices that she makes, raising her family, this young boy who's not the hipster in class, the smartest kid, the troubled kid, doesn't end up in prison. None of those obvious dramatic... It's a life. It's a life. And that's a very brave thing to do as a filmmaker because everything in film tells you you need to go to the most entertaining, dramatic, radical conclusions at any point. And Hollywood is known as a place where people are vain, so it would be logical for a very pretty woman to say, wait a minute, I'm going to age? Did you think about that? Yeah, I was excited about that because my earlier career was about the ingenue, Thing, the stories of males and females falling in love and mating and all of that. And there's certainly validity to that. But I knew I wanted to get out of that as soon as possible. And I wanted to move on to this next part of my life. And I thought the life cycle of humans is so beautiful. From kids being little to us becoming old people. And I wanted to see that. And I knew we could in this movie see piece of that. All right. You also had to, you're doing a week a year, right? Take break, you do other stuff. Was it hard to keep coming back? It wasn't. It wasn't. The weird thing about this movie was, it was just a beautiful, beautiful experience. It's a wonderful film. Thank you. We all had the same concept about art and working together and helping each other and supporting each other. And we had a lot of fun. It's a very autobiographical story for Rick. And it started with that, but then he also opened it up to our con contributions and stories of other people's lives, and he curated from there and wrote. Did he separate from his wife? And did... Well, no, but when I watched the movie, 
I saw, yes, the movie we made, but at the same time I saw, oh, that's the year I had my daughter. Oh, right, that's when Ethan got remarried. Oh, that's when Rick had his twins. That's when I sent my son off to college. Oh, that year this happened. So I was seeing also our own real lives, things that happened with the crew when they got married, when they weren't there that year because their dad was dying, all these sort of things. Let's watch a scene from a brilliant film, Boyhood. Watch. Do you still love Dad? I still love your father. But that doesn't mean it was healthy for us to stay together. What if after we move, he's trying to find us and he can't? Well, that won't be a problem. He can call Grandma and she'll tell him. Or he can call information. We won't be hard to find. Is he still in Alaska? No, well, that's what your uncle says. I like him in polar bears or something. Yeah, well, I hope they're taming him. <laughs> Is it hard to work with kids? No, I love working with kids. I mean, they are really charismatic. And I think sometimes people worry about working with them because they're notorious scene stealers. But I love the life force of kids, the honesty of kids. They'll, they'll say, why are we doing this again? This isn't funny anymore. <laughs> they'll <laughs> say, well, you're real right. It's not funny anymore. Um, part of what was funny about this movie was the kids were learning about acting as we were going along. So there's a scene where I'm crying. And usually with another adult actor, they give you the moment to prepare yourself. But they were like, how are you making yourself cry? And you were about to roll. And so you're like, okay, sit next to me. One school of thought is this. Some people do this. Other people do this other thing. Here's what's going on for me right now. Okay, so let's be quiet, and I'm going to try to do this thing. <laughs> but usually you're not doing that with an adult actor. You've, had, you've been open about experiences with domestic abuse. Well, I, my mom was kind of violent when we were growing up, but I only had one boyfriend ever grab my hair, and that was a short relationship, and I broke up with him. Those emotional scenes, were they tough? Ah, uh, were they tough? Well, it's always tough when you go to that place, but also hopefully you open up a channel where you're sort of communicating with other women that really are going through that. And we talked about that. There's a scene with the kids. The kids hadn't experienced domestic abuse, so they didn't know what that was like, something terrifying like that. But we talked about, yes, you haven't been through this, but other kids are going through this right now, and how do you think they would feel? And as actors, it's sort of our responsibility to tell the truth of their story in this moment. And so they really were amazing immediately. We were joking in between takes because we didn't want to freak them out. or But then we'd go right back into the scene. Is there a lot of pressure when people say it looks like your favorite to win an Oscar? It's a little bit terrifying, I guess, yeah. I mean, I never even imagined that I'd be nominated for an Oscar, and that in itself, no one could take that away, so that's pretty incredible. What's your take on the, the view that the Oscars are whitewashed this year? Um... Because last year, 12 I, Years a Slave won. Right, yeah. yeah, well, I think, really, there was a lot of things that happened in between. I, I don't know that the screeners got in in time, frankly. I know a lot of people that didn't get their screeners in time to vote for nominations. Really? Yeah, a lot of people. Well, that's, that's a shame. Yeah, uh, well, it came out very late in the year, so they didn't have much time. So I don't know that that's their fault completely either. I think it was maybe bad timing. There were incredible performances this year, and not all of them were acknowledged. But I think the ones that were were also wonderful. The film is Boyhood. It's great. It'll play forever. It'll play for as long as it took to make. <laughs> when we return, we'll switch gears and talk about Patricia's highly anticipated new TV role, Uncle A. Our guest is Patricia Arquette. She is one of the stars of a great movie, Boyhood. She's a nominee for an Academy Award. When the award season ends, then this is all over for you, Boyhood. And you've been living with this for 12 years, right? Yeah, that's going to be very hard. It's a goodbye, goodbye. The last year was very hard to stop shooting. I, I said, I don't think this is really a 12-year movie. This is a 20-year movie. This mm -hmm. is a movie that ends when this actress dies and the <laughs> mom dies. <laughs> so, yeah, it will be really painful. <laughs> All right, tell me about uh, CSI Cyber. Yeah, so... That's your new series. Mm -hmm. 
When does that start? Uh, in March. It starts early March. Which network? CBS. Yes. Another CSI series. Right. But like the first CSI, when the first CSI started, which was all about um, forensic crime, just a few years before that, in the O.J. Simpson trial, they were talking about DNA, and no one knew what the hell that was. And it just sounded like some fake science. Now we know what DNA is and how much that's changed law enforcement's ability to solve crimes. This is all cyber-related. And so much crime now is cyber-related. not kidding. And things like the Sony hack, it's just the tip of the iceberg. Everything we have is now just so enmeshed with technology, our banking systems, our houses are on alarms, uh, our cars have Wi-Fi's in them that tell us if they're running well or not. People can hack your car, people can hack into your There's house no privacy. Alarm. There's no privacy, that's a whole nother thing. Um, so it's really interesting. To me, the subject matter was really interesting. And to work with the CSI team, these guys who made the original one, they really know how to write. Well, these are the original guys? Yeah, who created this. So who do you play? And Jerry Bruckheimer does a great job of making it look like a movie. Um, I play a character named Avery Ryan. It's based on this woman named uh, Mary Aiken, although her life story and her reality is very different. She's a, a cyber psychologist. So she looks at the choices that a target's making and what they might make next and how to profile them according to the likelihood. Who else is in it? Uh, James Vanderbeek, Shad Moss, who's also known as Bow Wow, a rapper. He's amazing. Charlie Coons. Is it set in L.A.? Peter McNichol. Um, uh, yes, it's it's not set in L.A. It's set in Washington, D.C. Washington. Do you shoot in Washington or just No, we shoot in L.A., yeah. Exteriors. Hopefully we'll shoot more exteriors and hopefully end up going a little more global with these stories. I mean, it's pretty shocking every time I get a script, I think. Oh, can they really do this? Is this thing really capable of that? Because, yes, people introduce new technologies for a specific purpose, but then criminals will take it and twist it and use it for something else. Do you have cyber experts around? We do. So that the statements are true? Well, it's all fictitious uh, you have to bend also. A yeah, yeah, it's it's storytelling, so these aren't actual crimes, but they're pieces of different crimes put together. Has this made you, having this role, learning more, made you more worry about it? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, for me, it was a, a big stretch because I'm not tech savvy, <laughs> and I already was a little suspicious of it, and now I'm kind of blown away by the vulnerability of it. You've had some great roles, though. I mean, Boardwalk Empire, what was that like? It was so fun. Those guys are great. I mean, great writers, great actors. I got to work a lot with Steve, and he's <laughs> so generous and funny. And So I had a blast on that. My character was a real boozy, broad, tough, toughy toenails. You won an Emmy for Medium. Mm -hmm. Do you enjoy TV as much as movies, or is it film, film? Well, it's different. You work as a group in a way like we did in Boyhood, but you work together every day as this team, and sometimes for years, as an acting troupe, and you really know your crew, and... But you have a time limit, don't you? You have a time limit. It makes your, your brain faster for memorizing. You have to be more instinctual and move quickly. But in a way, it's not unlike small movies, because you also don't have time on those. Patricia Arquette, Academy Award nominee, Golden Globe nominee, a star of a tremendous film, Boyhood. We'll highlight uh, Patricia's inspiring humanitarian work in our next segment. We'll play a little game of If You Only Knew. More with the Oscar nominee after the break. We're back with Patricia Arquette. The movie is Boyhood. In an interview with The Guardian, you said, there really is a lot of pressure on actresses to look a strange and unrealistic way. You're not supposed to age. You're supposed to be perpetually incredibly attractive because that's the way the movie world is. You might be 50, but you need to talk 35. Frankly, there is no shorter shelf life other than that of a child actor than that of the ingenue. Mm. Still feel that way. 
Yeah, definitely. I think a lot of actresses feel that pressure. I think that's the feedback they get when they don't get certain parts. And and I, I think that's part of what's beautiful about this movie is a long time studios have been saying to small filmmakers, audiences don't want to see that. And the success of this movie, the way it's moved people, I've never been in a movie where people left a theater and said, I called my mom and told her I was sorry. I we decided not to get a divorce as a couple. Um, we decided to have a child. I mean, it's these are life-moving, yeah. life yeah. serious things. And yes, I, I have worked in a business that has thought audiences don't want to see that. But the truth is, in my part, a struggling single mom, we know this woman in our life, but filmmakers don't really examine her, don't really spend time with her. But Richard Linkletter, who was raised predominantly by a single mom, cared about that subject matter and believed that mattered and believed this boy's journey mattered and discovering who we are as people matter. And now a lot of little movies are getting financed because people think they're similar to boyhood. You've always worked, haven't you? I have always worked. You're the co-founder of a nonprofit called Give Love. What is it? Yeah, givelove.org um, is a well, at first, right after the earthquake in Haiti, we wanted to go down, so we built some housing out of refurb refurbished shipping containers as dormitories and for orphans and classrooms. And, and then we went on to doing eco-sanitation work, which is thermophilic composting. So much of the world, they don't have toilets. More people in the world have cell phones than toilets. And the lack of sanitation is the number one pollutant to water. And Waterborne illness kills more kids than AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis combined. So suddenly we discovered there was this great need, very few people doing it. You need really low cost systems, systems that don't need solar, because in the developing world, people will steal solar. Anything that's valuable, people will steal. So you have to have materials that are locally found, don't have to be shipped in, stuck in customs. You have to have things that are very low tech so people can fix them on the spot when they need to. So we really went for a system, a system that was as low cost as possible, as few working parts as possible, and that communities could learn to do for themselves. You do a lot of work in Haiti, right? Did a lot of work. Yeah. Sean Penn worked with you there? He well, helped us a lot. We ended up just being a de facto camp management runner, which was insane. There's this area called City Soleil that's been called the most dangerous place on earth by the United Nations. And we ended up landing there. We were told we had land, which turned out to be land in dispute, so we were going to build on. But there we were. No one had tents. No one had food. No one had water. There was only one Italian NGO working in that area because it's in the red zone. So NGOs can't work there because people notoriously get kidnapped there. So we ended up sleeping in this tent camp. <laughs> it was ridiculous. And I thought, me and my best friend who has four kids, we ended up having to go get food tickets and knock on the door of the UN, the Brazilian UN, and ask for a couple soldiers so we could pass them out, these food tickets. And mm -hmm. I was thinking, I was just watching this at home on TV. When you hear about all these tent camps, you think someone's doing something. You think there's some big aid group showing up and taking care of this, but it, it's not the way you think. It's not the way you think at all. For more information, it's givelove.com? Dot org. Dot org. Oh, yes, charities are all. Givelove.org. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, we're going to play a quick game of You Only Knew. I okay. just throw quick. Remember the first boy you kissed? Yes, I what do. What was his name? Louis. Louis. How old were you? I think I was six and he was maybe nine. Where was this? In Virginia. Where in Virginia? In Skymont, near Front Royal. I know that territory. It's on the way to Shenandoah, right? Yeah. Yeah. A famous role you turned down? Uh, well, oh, uh, in Pulp Fiction. You turned down Pulp Fiction? Yeah, I'd just done True Romance, and I think something else was going on in my life at that time. But Uma was great in it, and I'm really happy for oh, it. Omitting Boyhood, what has been your favorite role? Hmm. I can't really answer that because they've all taught me a certain lesson, but 
True Romance was a very pivotal film for me. Tony Scott, who I really miss, uh, taught me to listen to my own instincts as a woman. Did you have any idea that he was troubled? No, and you know, my instinct is that it was medical. You know, a lot of, I know a lot of people that took Ambien or sleeping pills that went into blackouts, so I don't know what exactly happened there. Any actor or actress that you'd love to work with? Oh, there's so many. Well, Jenna Rollins. Um, I worked once with Jessica Lange. I'd love to work with her again. Um, Diane Keaton. Director you'd like to work with? I could keep going with actresses. <laughs> there's, a, there's a whole lot of them. Uh, directors. Um, Wong Kar Wai comes to mind. What was your life like as a teen in L.A.? Wild. It was crazy time. L.A. was filthy. Like, you could see the air. It was like brownish, yellow, strange. I spent a lot of time on Hollywood Boulevard. It Are was you wild? a disaster. I was really nice, and I was a virgin for a long time, and I was kind of like very proper inside, but I was also wild outside. So <laughs> I had a black mohawk, and my friends were all punk rockers, and <laughs> we were took a lot of chances. Do you believe in real-life mediums? I, I have had a couple experiences that were pretty undeniable, strange things no one could have known. Having said that, I think the majority of them aren't. And I think we all have a little instincts ourselves. Something, something we would find on your DVR. Um, well, let's see. Well, on my DVR, well, I have Boardwalk on there right now. Pet peeve. When men don't take the trash out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Good line. A guilty pleasure. Well, I, I do watch a lot of HGTV, like House Hunters International. It really <laughs> relaxes me. <laughs> yeah, I guess real estate porn. I look at like Riyadh's in Morocco and stuff like that. Something that really angers you. Well, there's a lot. I guess injustice, murder, war. Well, really what drives me crazy right now is... Pedophiles and rape. Nothing I like about that. Something makes you laugh. My boyfriend makes me laugh. What does he do? He's a painter. His name's Eric White. He's an incredible painter. Your most cherished memory? Well, it would have to be my kids having my babies. How many? Two. Are they grown? My son's 26 and my daughter's 11. My son Enzo, my daughter Harlow. Up next, we'll wrap things up with some questions from Patricia's fans on social media. You've heard of that. <laughs> Don't click away. We're back with Patricia Arquette. We wish her the best of luck on Academy Awards tonight. I hope she wins for her role in Boyhood. How's David? How's the fam? David Arquette was here uh, a while ago, in and out of rehab. How's he doing? He's doing great. He's David is the nicest person I've ever met on earth. Good guy. Oh my God, every time I'm with David, his phone will ring. I'm like, who are you talking to? Well, I'm trying to help this guy. He's very sick and he needs a ride to the doctor. And He's just always helping people. He wants everyone to do well. He has the most beautiful heart. What kind of name is Arquette? French? It's French, yeah. And how's Alexis? Great. She was here yeah. a couple of years ago too. Yes, I know, I saw it, yes. Is it hard watching yourself back during the early boyhood scenes? No, it's a little bit like, wow, wow, I was very young. <laughs> wow, I'd already been through a lot. I already had a 12-year-old. I mean, I look young oh, yeah, in that, yeah. but I already had a pretty grown-up kid. Um, but as an actor, it's weird, because you'll be turning the channel, and sometimes you'll bump into your younger self. I don't think people really go back and watch their home movies all the time. No. But as an actor, if you've been working a long time, I'll turn the channel and see Ethan when he's 14 on TV. Like, wow. Do you have a favorite scene in the film? You know, I think Ethan does such beautiful work. He's such an incredible actor, and he always makes his projects better, and he's so generous of an actor. I think actor. he's been, this weird term, underrated over the years. I think actors really know he's a serious heavy hitter, and I think directors appreciate that too. And he's... He's had some big movies, for sure, throughout the years, but I think act that Ethan's one of our great treasures. 
We have some social media questions. Only one Valerie on Twitter. Do you remember the first film you ever saw? I think it was Dumbo. And <laughs> then and then it was, uh, what was it called, that movie? Um, hmm. It was the only Native American lead action movie. Billy, Billy Jack. Billy, oh, Bill, oh yeah. So I saw Dumbo a, and then Billy Jack. That was a hell of a movie. That was a hell of a movie, Billy Jack. So was Dumbo. Dumbo mm. broke my heart. Yeah. My boyfriend hasn't seen it yet, so I'm going to show him. That <laughs> scene with Mrs. Jumbo when she's in jail is <laughs> one of the best ever. Uh, Javier Relax tweets, what's your fondest memory from the making of True Romance? Mm. Well, we played a trick once on uh, Michael Rappaport. That was pretty funny. We did some pranks on people. Are you a prankster? I've been known to prank a what, once in a while, but I haven't for many years. That's the most dangerous kind of prankster. Not someone pranks all the time, just yeah, occasional. Yeah, you never know. Yes, you slowly uh, wait, and then you do your prank. It's not though she did it again. Wait another decade, prank again. <laughs> <laughs> like making a movie. <laughs> uh, Joe Dotson 5 on Instagram, did the boyhood cast become its own family? Yes. I mean, yes. Here's the thing, when Rick cast Eller, the lead, boy. He also cast the parents who are both artists and really into this concept of their son doing this and un loved Rick's movies already and understood. Had he had different parents, maybe we wouldn't have finished this movie. Maybe it, he wouldn't have grown up to be who he was. So he has a great family in his own and it was part of the boyhood family, his family. But he did spend the night at my house last night. We watched movies and he made himself breakfast this morning. <laughs> That's nice. Yellow JKT on Instagram. Did did your medium role impact your time filming Boyhood? Was there ever an overlap? Oh yeah, there was always an overlap. But like I said, when I first got medium, I said I told them I had a pre, you know, I already had a commitment. So they moved things around, and it wasn't easy for them. And a lot of times, I came back with new haircuts. They'd have to incorporate. <laughs> uh, Larry Brown on Facebook. Was the film Stigmata as tough to film as it looked? I think Stigmata was tougher to film than it looked. It was a really hard movie to shoot. You've had a great career. What's next? Oh, you got Cyber. I got CSI Cyber, and I also did a film called The Wannabe that Martin Scorsese produced that the will Wannabes? be out next year. Yeah, it's a very dark, gritty, uh, dramatic movie about this couple in the early 90s. I'm so glad to have had you here. Thank you. So great nice family, to be here. great Thank talent, you. And great movie. Thank you. Thanks. My thanks to the lovely Patricia Arquette for joining me. And if you haven't seen it yet, you're missing out. Go see Boyhood right now. As always, you can find me on Twitter at King's Things. I'll see you next time.